ஸ்ரீ குருபியோ நமக நமஸ்தே ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் ஜெய்ஹிந்த் யூ மே பி வண்டரிங் ஆஸ் டு வாய் ஐ சே ஜெய்ஹிந்த் ரைட் அட் த பிகினிங் வி ஆர் செலிப்ரேட்டிங் ஆர் நேஷன் வி ஆர் செலிப்ரேட்டிங் ஆர் பாரத் அண்ட் தட் இஸ் வாய் வி ஷுட் சே ஜெய்ஹிந்த் இஸ்ன்ட் இட் the country is celebrating the 75th year of its independence rather it is celebrating 75 years of having been independent and that is what is azadi ka amrit mahotsav we all know india as a country attained independence in 1947 and so we are celebrating our freedom what exactly is amrit mahotsav 75 years generally means amrit utsav like how we say golden jubilee silver jubilee silver jubilee for 25 years and golden for 50 years it becomes amrit for 75 and so we say amrit mahotsav but it is not that alone 75 is a number it is not that number alone that is important freedom of our nation is our amrit and what is amrit nectar nectar gives what what is amrit called amrit safeguards and protects us from mrutyu which means it gives us a permanence it gives us a permanent life it frees us from death is it not so as a nation as a country as that wholesome humanity we are free from deterioration from death and we shall keep growing and that is what amrit mahotsav really means and today we shall be seeing some of those people who contributed to our freedom to the freedom struggle they laid their lives and because of their sacrifice we are today enjoying our freedom and celebrating the amrit mahotsav when we say we are celebrating freedom and independence it also means that we are celebrating our honor and pride and rightly so the pride of the nation the honor of the nation have all been safeguarded by those people who contributed their might contributed their lives and their all for the well being of the nation what shall we call them i shall prefer to call them the unsung heroes we know the names of some of the heroes but we are not even aware of some other names can we believe that some of them were so young that they were still in their teens when they sacrificed their lives for the country can we believe that some of them did this sacrifice when they were ripe into old age in their 70s and 80s can we also believe that some of them were well educated but some of them had just come out of school for the sake of participating in the freedom struggle it is also true that some of them gave up their jobs their families their newly wedded wife and so on and so many things these 
were the unsung heroes and they will continue to be our unsung heroes or our role models, is it not? We shall look at these heroes, their lives for some more time to come and try to learn from their lives. Try to learn as to what we can do and how we can contribute to the betterment of our country. The first hero whom we would see today is actually a woman. You may ask me, the term hero would only fit a man and then there is a feminine word for calling someone a hero. Call by whatever name, the words don't really matter because it is the personality, it is the persona that matters to us. This lady was also called by a particular title and that is why I think we should start with her. Generally, whenever we talk about the country's independence and the freedom struggle, the first name that strikes many of our minds is the name of the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. But then, can we think of an individual who was called the Lady Gandhi or the Mahila Gandhi? Generally, when you prefix the word lady, you tend to think in terms of the wife of the individual and that is why we call her Mahila Gandhi or Buri Gandhi. Buri Gandhi will mean the old lady Gandhi or Mahila Gandhi will mean the woman who is equated to Gandhi. And who was this lady? Her name was Matangini Hasra. It's a pure coincidence that she was born in the same year as Mahatma Gandhi. She was born on the 19th of October 1869 and in a very remote village in the Bengal Presidency. For those of you who may not be aware, let me just put it in very simple terms. When the Britishers were taking care of many things in this land, they had certain pockets of government like the Bengal Presidency, the Bombay Presidency, the Madras Presidency and so on. Calcutta, Kolkata as we call today, Calcutta and so many areas around Calcutta formed part of the Bengal Presidency. Similarly, Chennai or the erstwhile Madras and several other regions and areas around Madras including places like Mangalore, and the southern districts were all part of the Madras Presidency. So Bengal Presidency was that area around Calcutta and in a remote village in Bengal Presidency was born this lady by name Matangini Hasra and she was married young she was the daughter of a poor farmer. She did not have any formal education. Probably she did not even go to school. Believe me, it was 1869 and thereafter. Not many facilities available at that point of time, especially in the villages. And this little girl was married when she was 12 years of age. And you know what? How destiny struck her? She was widowed when she was 18 years of age and she had no children. 
from that time when she had been widowed she was living a life of solitude it so happened that she heard about mahatma gandhi when she was in her 20s and 30s and she was attracted by the gandhian principles and since she thought she had to do something good to the people around her she involved herself in the national movement and in all those meetings which the then indian national congress called for in her region she took to kadi she started spinning the charkha and all the time in the house she would sit in one corner and keep spinning the rate or the charkha and spun kadi she gave up all her luxurious items probably she had just a few of them maybe one or two pieces of jewelry and one or two good dresses or attire even those she gave up and she started wearing kadi as per the wishes of mahatma gandhi we all know gandhi was spreading the message of kadi that time and not only gandhi even other people other freedom fighters were all spreading the information of kadi the significance of kadi the significance of home spinning and the significance of using home made goods in other words they were boycotting foreign goods and foreign textile and clothing matangini was also part of this boycott movement she gave up all those things which indicated luxury and some kind of pomp she was living a very simple life but then she would participate in all those movements of freedom struggle she was part of the non cooperation movement she would take this information and spread the awareness to all those women and children around her those women who were not educated who were less fortunate and made it the significance of her life made it the objective of her life to spread the message of independence it was during such life that she also met with her end what really happened but before we see what really happened to her at the time of her death we should also remind ourselves that she participated in the salt satyagraha that was in 1930 she was arrested but then she was let out immediately however she continued to be part of the salt satyagraha movement and was against the salt tax so she went about in her own place wherever she was living her own village she went about telling people that salt talk salt tax is wrong and she kind of made everyone oppose the salt tax for which she was once again arrested and she was put in jail for a period of 6 months she was in the barampur jail and that was a significant turn in her life in the jail she met people who were arrested and brought to the jail for their participation in the freedom movement in different parts of the same region she spoke with them she learnt more she got to know what exactly is the freedom movement for that is when she decided that she will continue to do all her contribution 
for the sake of the freedom movement. From 1930 onwards till around 1942, for almost a period of 12 years, she did all her best. She went about telling people about the freedom movement. She went about participating in processions and protests and she was on and off threatened by the then police. However, the climax was in 1942. 1942, we all know, was the time of the August Revolution or the Quit India Movement. During the Quit India Movement, at different towns and places, people took processions they led processions and expressed their protest to the British Kingdom, to the British rule of India, to the British anarchy in India. At this time, Mathangini was given the responsibility of leading the procession in her place. It is called the Thaimur procession. She was asked to lead the procession and mark the protest against the British rule. She led the procession. There were about hundreds and hundreds of people following her. And the British police was right in front of the procession. Probably Mathangini stepped forward to tell the British policeman not to fire on the people of the procession, on the participants. Probably she stepped forward for that, we do not know, but as she stepped forward, she was shot at. And imagine, it was such a short distance that the bullet struck her on her chest and she fell down. However, she was still raising her arms and trying to prevent the police from reaching across and going closer to people who were behind her. At this time, she was repeatedly shot at. And you know what her age was at that time? She was 73. A 73 year old woman trying to safeguard her people and taking the bullets on herself. Mathangini died on that day. And that was in 1942 on the September 29th. Mathengini lived in the erstwhile Bengal presidency, we know. The place where she died is a place which is close to the place called Midnapur. And so Mathengini Hazra is sometimes referred to as the grand old lady of Midnapur. And in Midnapur, you could see the screen now that there is a statue in her honor. And what you see now in the screen is a small little hutment, a small little house. The house which has been erected in the area where she was born. Probably the house in which she was born no longer exists. That was all way back in 1869. So what they have subsequently done is, in the place where her house was, another small little house has been erected. And what you now see, the next house is the house into which she was married, her marital home. And you now see a plaque. This plaque 
is in honor of Matangini Hazra. And this block is kept in the place where she fell down. She was shot at. She bled, fell down and gave up her life. Is not Matangini Hazra qualified enough to be our first unsung hero, Buri Gandhi or the Mahila Gandhi? After Mahila Gandhi, whom shall we see? Shall we now see one other woman? She was not as old as Matangini was. But then, though she was young, her contribution was much, much earlier. And who is this woman? She is the Kittur Rani Chennamma. Kittur is a small area in the state of Karnataka. Chennama was born in a kind of a quasi-regal family, once again in a small village in the Belagavi district of Karnataka. As you can see, she was born on the 14th of November 1778 and she died on the 21st of February 1829. Chenama, as she grew up, was given a lot of training since she belonged to the quasi-regal family, probably her father thought that she would have to be inducted into the martial arts. Maybe she would marry a prince or a king and there could probably a necessity for her to know the martial arts. So her father decided to train her in archery, in sword fighting and of course in horse riding. Chenama knew all this as she grew up. She was trained well and true to the family lineage, she was married to Raja Mallasarja of that area. And she lived a happy life. She had a son. Her husband was the ruler of that province. And she was the Rani, Rani of the Kittur province. However, destiny would not leave her. In 1824, her husband Malla Sarja died. And she was left now to protect the province, take care of the people who depended on the Raja and the Rani. However, destiny would still not leave her. Her son became sick and he also died. One after the other, two blows, both in 1824, Malla Sarja and the son both died and Chennama was left alone. To help her in the regal duties, she thought she would now take Svikar of a son. We all know the principle and the process of Svikar, isn't it? So she made a boy by name Shivalingappa as her son, adopted him and declared to the world that he would be her legal son. Friends, please remember what you have studied in your history textbooks. 
when the British people were ruling us, they brought in a regulation called the doctrine of lapse. You know what this doctrine of lapse meant? Let us say this way, there is a king, fine, the king dies. The king's son would rule the kingdom. The son also dies. There is no one else in that same family. What now would happen? The queen or the rani may adopt a son or a daughter and then declare that son or the daughter as the legal heir to the kingdom and continue ruling the kingdom. Nothing wrong, isn't it? But then this is where the British people exploited. This was a golden opportunity for them to annex the territory. Now there is a territory here and this territory belonged to the king. The king died. The king's son died. Now the widow is left alone. What they thought this area or this territory can be just taken away and annexed to the British territory or the land which was under the control of the British. One easy way of expanding their kingdom, one easy way of expanding their jurisdiction. So they promulgated what is called the doctrine of lapse. By lapse, the territory becomes theirs. The territory which has lapsed into their hands can be taken by them. So they brought in this doctrine of lapse and told all those widowed queens that they cannot adopt a child and their land will come to the British forces and the queen will have to just leave the country, go, beg, or do whatever, earn a livelihood or die. And this is what they did to Chennama too. So when Chennama adopted Shivalingappa, they said, you cannot adopt this boy. And this boy is declared an illegal ruler and the British forces made a conquest on the territory of Kittur. First time the British forces came, Chennama decided to fight. Of course, she knew horse riding. She was good at the swords and she was also wonderful in taking aim with the arrows. She knew archery. So with all this, she decided to fight. She led her troops. Of course, she had a very good lieutenant and that lieutenant by name Rayanna, Sangoli Rayanna was also with her. So the first time there was a kind of a war between the British troops and Chenama's troops, she won. There was a political agent by name John Thackeray. This political agent would be the mediator between the East India Company. The East India Company was the one which, which was trying to annex the territory. And immediately after the East India Company, it was the Vice Royalty and the troops of the Vice Royalty. So, John Thackeray was the mediator on one side with the East India Company and the British Vice Royalty troops and on the other side Kito Rani. But it so happened that John Thackeray himself was killed in the first battle and Sangoli Rayanna and Chennama were successful enough to get two British agents as hostages also. Two people were caught as hostages. That was the time the entire area had a British commissioner. 
the British administration had appointed a commissioner for that area and that commissioner was responsible in getting all those territories annexed. The name of this commissioner was Chaplin. When Chenama had two hostages with her, British people as hostages, she kind of had some talks with Chaplin and informed Chaplin that she would release these two hostages, but then she should be permitted and given freedom to rule over her area. Chaplin first agreed. So she released the two hostages. But what happened? As we can expect, Chaplin did not keep up his words. The conquest on Kittur continued and Chenama had to again fight. Continuous spree of fight for some years and in 1829 as the war continued in the second phase of the war Junior Munro was also killed. There was a British personality by name Sir Thomas Munro. Probably one day we would see a little about Thomas Munro, but not today. Just remember the name Thomas Munro. And this Junior Munro was a nephew of Thomas Munro. He was part of the British troops of that area and he was also killed. Now all these things were indirectly contributing to the victory of Chennama, but then that was also causing a lot of hostility and jealousy amongst the British people. So they would not leave her. War kept on continuing. She had some problem or the other at some area in the border. The British troops would cause some problem. Again, if she overcomes in the other area, there would be some other problem. And it kept on going like this. And at one point of time, with all the organized troops that the British people had, Rani Chennama was captured. She was captured and she was imprisoned in the Bailhongal fort. She was kept in the fort. She was there. She was there in the fort. Though a captive, she still nursed a hope that one day she could come out and still get freedom for her people. But then the news of her Lieutenant Sangoli Rayana also being caught and Sangoli Rayana being tortured, she could not tolerate that. And it is said, though we have no proper proof for that, it is said that she consumed particles of diamond. Probably she was wearing some piece of jewellery. She was after all a Rani and she could have had some piece of jewellery which had diamonds in it and she is supposed to have made the diamond into powders and had consumed it. We all know diamond even if it is broken into tiny pieces has sharp edges and the sharp edges would cut inside, cut the stomach the gut system and the intestine and cause bleeding and death. The records I told you are not very clear and what do we expect? After all, the British were keeping the records then. And thus came the end of Kitturani Chennamma. Chennamma died on the 21st of February 1829. But Rani Chennamma is remembered even today. 1829 was much, much before 1857. 1857 
was when the British Vice Royalty was established. Until then, it was only the regime of the East India Company. East India Company was a trading company. They came here to trade, but then they caught hold of territories. And that is where the significance of people like Rani Chennamma, who fought and raised their strength against the East India Company's thinking of annexing territories. Now friends, what do we learn from these two women? Two great unsung women of our country. Matangini Hazra gave up everything. She didn't have any support. She didn't have children. She didn't have any support. But even with no support, Standing alone, one widowed woman, she took up on herself the responsibility of bringing good to the people around her. A true mother, isn't it? A true mother is one who brings in or attempts to bring in goodness to people around her, thinking that all of them are her children. And similarly, we find Kiturani Chennamma, who lost her son and who had to give up her adopted son also. That adopted son was overthrown and she was conquered upon. Nevertheless, she fought till the end. When we think there is something that we need to stand for, something which we should protect. Isn't it our responsibility and duty to stand for that till the end? And that is what is called Vairagya. We say Vairagya. What is Vairagya? Vairagya is standing by Dharma, protecting Dharma or trying to protect Dharma, giving up everything else for the sake of Dharma. And that is what we find in these two women who stood for the cause of Dharma, stood in courage and vairagya and contributing to the welfare of others. Fine, after we have seen these two women, do we have to see somebody else also now? Yes, we shall go to one other personality. This man was called Chittaranjan Das. Chittaranjan Das or Desh Bandhu Chittaranjan Das. Chittaranjan Das was born on the 5th November 1870 and died on the 16th of June, 1925. He was born in the erstwhile Calcutta or the present Kolkata. His family had hailed from Bikrampur, which is near Dhaka. Dhaka, of course, is in Bangladesh today. But then, all those areas, as we have seen before earlier, were part of the Bengal Presidency. And Chitranjan Das hailed from a very, very popular and famous lineage. His father was Bhuban Mohan Das. He was a scholar and his uncle was Durga Mohan Das, who was by then itself was a Brahmo Samaj celebrity. Coming from this kind of a family background and with several lawyers in the family, it is not a surprise that Chitranjan Das wanted to do law and then practice law. 
so he also studied law and as was customary in those days as part of acquiring a barrister degree he also sailed to london and pursued his law studies in london when he was in london he befriended orbind ghosh who was in london at that time and of course he also became a friend of sarojini naidu and then there were other indians who had gone to london for several studies and of course there were also indians around london and they would all meet periodically you know it is regular isn't it if we all go to some other place or we uh, go for studies to a different town we try and meet up with one another with friends often so these indians were trying to meet one another in london and it was in london that they also met dada bai nauroji dada bai nauroji was often labeled the grand old man of india and dada bai nauroji was part of the british parliamentary system he was trying to represent india there so sarojini naidu orbind ghosh chitranjan das all of them were promoting dada bai nauroji and his ideals in fact it was being with dada bai nauroji that these people who were much younger to nauroji learnt the concept of nationalism and also thought india should soon get freedom from the british clutches of course he came back from london he came to calcutta he set up his law practice at calcutta one interesting episode that we should remember about chitranjan das now today we cannot discuss his entire life and this session our session on unsung heroes will not discuss the entire life of all these heroes but then one or two important incidences we can see there was a very famous trial called the alipore bomb case trial there was a bomb blast in alipore and orbind ghosh was arrested in this bomb blast case they thought orbind ghosh was involved though he was not directly involved maybe in that case in that bomb blast incidents his brother baron ghosh had some indirect contact however orbind ghosh was not involved but then orbind ghosh was arrested and you know what chitranjan das was the defense lawyer for orbind ghosh in this case and he brought orbind ghosh out the defense statement that chitranjan das gave during the last phase of the hearing of the alipore bomb case is quoted as the best statement of independence and freedom he said here is the hero the hero for whom i am at the high court of justice but not only the high court of justice but also the high court of history long after this hero is gone his voice will still echo not only in india but in the distant lands and seas his voice is the voice of poetry poetry of independence poetry of humanity poetry of swaraj what a wonderful defense statement it was 
and you know what thanks to this defense by chitranjan das orbind ghosh was released and acquitted from the alipore bomb blast trial and that is what made orbind ghosh resort to philosophy and go to pondicherry chitranjan das was a journalist himself he wrote poetry i shall tell you something about his poetry a little later but then it is for us also to know that chitranjan das was associated with the anushilan samiti what was this anushilan samiti it was a kind of an organization which consolidated the efforts of youth of young people to the cause of the national movement now what happens generally is people are there everybody wants to contribute but then you require someone to consolidate all the efforts and coordinate anushilan samiti was started by a gentleman by name pramatha mittar and along with pramatha mittar and mn roy chitranjan das was part of the anushilan samiti he involved the youth and a kind of initiated them into the national movement gave them encouragement told them what to do and it was consolidating the efforts of the youth personally he also participated in the non cooperation movement from the years 1919 to 1922 he was part of the movement that boycotted foreign goods foreign textiles he took up to khadi he only clad khadi and if you see his photographs even today shortly you will see his picture on the screen you will find that he always donned white simple khadi and he believed in the constitutional methods of nationalism meaning he preferred a satvik way he was an advocate of hindu muslim unity and he also championed the cause of national education and chitranjan das as i told you was a poet himself he was often called the desh bandhu because of his activities where you know he was on one side for the national movement and he was consolidating the efforts of everyone around and then getting everybody into the movement of national struggle he was called desh bandhu or the relative of the country the bandhu of the nation of course later somewhere around 1923 he fell apart from the indian national congress because of various reasons and then went on to find his minds liking in people like motilal nehru so jointly motilal nehru husain sukhravardi and chitranjan das founded the swaraj party in 1923 friends i told you he was a poet himself he wrote in bengali and some of his poems are classic examples of what poetry should be the song of the sea this particular poem has an interesting background orbind ghosh translated some of chitranjan das poems into english of course das sent his poems to gosh who was in pondicherry already and uh, you know arvind gosh was also a poet himself so he found it like uh, it was his heart there and he started translating but something very interesting happened in between when arvind gosh was in pondicherry he did not have economic means often no income no money so in one of his communication to chitranjan das orbind ghosh said i 
no income and I require money for something, something of that kind, like, you know, trying to tell him that I require some more money. And then it was also the time when Das had sent his poems to Ghosh and Ghosh had translated some of them. So when Das got the translation, he sent him thousand rupees and said, let this be your income. It was not that he was treating Aurobindo Ghosh's translation for the purpose of giving him income, but then it was a way that they could help one another. And uh, of course, overwork took its toll. Chitranjan Das was continuously overworking and consequently fell sick. With a failing health in 1925, doctors advised him to move out of Kolkata, which was already polluted. So he went to Darjeeling. When he was Darjeeling, Gandhi visited him and when Gandhi was leaving Darjeeling, Gandhi said, I'm leaving Darjeeling, but I'm also leaving Das, the friend of the nation. Shortly thereafter, Chitaranjan Das breathed his last and in the funeral, that took place at Kolkata. Mahatma Gandhi led the funeral procession. Few years before his death, Chitranjan Das had given his property, the place where his house was and then the garden around, that part of the property he had given it for the purpose of using for the welfare of women. He was an advocate of women's education and their rights. So he said, let this property be used for the purpose of betterment of women. And that is where the Chittaranjan Seva Sadan, something for Seva, was started and the organization functioned there. Years later, in 1950, after independence, in the same place where the Chittaranjan Seva Sadhan was functioning, the Chittaranjan Cancer Hospital was also founded. Chittaranjan Das is a great name in the annals of Indian history, Desh Bandhu. And so many people in India Somewhere around the 1940s and 1950s, when sons were born to them, preferred to call their sons Chittaranjan after Chittaranjan Das. He was also a hero and continues to be a hero. Matangini Hazra, Kittu Rani Chennamma, Chittaranjan Das. Who next in our list? Bipin Chandrapal. Bipin Chandrapal also was born in the Bengal presidency in a small hamlet near the Silet district of Bengal. His father was a Persian scholar and a landlord. Bipin Chandrapal is usually hailed the father of revolutionary thoughts in India. If India and Indian independence struggle can boast of some revolutionary activities, people like Bhagat Singh, Madan Lal Dingra and so on, the revolutionary thoughts found their root found their springhead in Bipin Chandrapal. And that is why he is called the father of revolutionary thoughts. He was, of course, one of the early congressmen. But then many of us would have heard that there was a trio, the Ball, Lol, Paul trio. Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Lala Lajapatrai 
and Bipin Chandrapal. Bipin Chandrapal was very, very famous in the southern parts of India, especially the Madras presidency. And Vivo Chidambaram Pillai was a very close associate of Bipin Chandrapal. Bipin Chandrapal's ideals were ideals of Purna Swaraj, not dominion status. He wanted Swaraj and then Swadeshi, boycott of foreign goods and national education. What exactly is national education? It is not mere education, not merely knowing a language, not merely knowing mathematics, arithmetic, science and so on. But then see education in the spirit of the nation, in the welfare of the nation and also inculcate all values of the original ancient Bharatiya culture. He was opposed to the caste system. He advocated widow remarriage. He practiced what he preached. He was married very early and his first wife died. After the first wife died, he remarried, remarried a widow and was a practitioner of what he preached. He of course did not agree with Mahatma Gandhi on certain principles because we all know Gandhi was for ahimsa and non-cooperation but then Bipin Chandrapal said all this will not help. We need to be a little courageous and little ociferous. He was assertive on nationalism and Aurobindo called him the mightiest prophet of nationalism. The mightiest prophet of nationalism. Again, Bipin Chandrapal was a journalist himself. He worked for magazines like the Bengal Tribune, the New India, New India of Gandhi and another magazine called Public Opinion. He advocated nationalism. He wrote articles in all these journals on nationalism so that the word of nationalism spread across and he was involved in educational activities, imparting national education. He had a wider perspective because he was a journalist. He knew what was happening in China. He knew what was happening in Russia, in Europe and then brought all that information through the journals and brought it to the people of India so that we get aware. And if today we talk about human rights and talk about labor values, remember it was Bipin Chandrapal who first talked about the 48 hour work week. 48 hour work week is a concept in labor rights and it was Paul who brought it first to this country and also demanded increase in wages for the poor laborers working in factories, textile mills and so on. So that way Bipin Chandrapal is a name to be remembered. Friends, as I told you, we shall not see the complete life sketch of all these individuals. But then as we see glimpses into their lives, I am sure each one of us would go back, read more about them and try to inculcate all those values that they stood for into our lives. If you ask me today, Chitaranjan Das means work, dharmic work to me. And what does Bipin Chandrapal mean? Bipin Chandrapal also will indicate continuous efforts towards the goal, perseverance and industrious labor. Remember these people contributed everything that they had. Chitaranjandas gave his property for the betterment of women. Bipin Chandrapal also used his intellectual caliber to educate people around. So here are the unsung heroes who have contributed to the upliftment of our society, 
unsung heroes of our freedom struggle. Next week, we shall meet again at the same time with the life sketches of some more unsung heroes. Until then, let's keep singing the praise of these heroes. Jai Hind!